Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Aristogenesis. It's been a minute or two since our last upload. Things have been rather busy and hectic. Personal life has unfortunately gotten in the way, but I won't bore you with details. Our upload schedule is obviously going to be a lot less regular going forward, and our ban from Spreaker certainly hasn't helped. Last episode, if you can cast your mind back to a time so long ago, we spoke about the origin myths and defining moments of some of the ancient tribes of Europe, starting off with the Germanic peoples. This episode, we will be continuing with that theme and moving on to the next groups we're going to focus on, namely the Nordics and the Anglo-Saxons. These are, of course, the groups most relevant to most of our listeners, but it would have been rather foolish to speak of them without first establishing the Germanic peoples as a whole. This episode will be focusing on the ancestors of the Swedes, especially the Goths, and rather than give a history lesson on all of their conquests and migrations, which has already been done very well by a number of people over the years, we'll be focusing on the aspects of their history that are most important in terms of tradition. But before we introduce the Goths, it's important to start off with the Scandinavians as a collective before delving deeper into the Swedes, Norwegians, Icelandics and Finns respectively in the coming episodes. To start off, I'd like to point out an observation made by the Roman historian Pliny the Elder regarding the Scandinavians and how it might elucidate a common point of confusion in the worldview of the ancient Scandinavians. Pliny says that Scandinavians viewed their nation as a world in and of itself. This means that the people did not conceive of the world as the conquering Romans or the nomadic Germans did, but rather they saw their country, their land, their people as the whole world. This would of course explain the somewhat complex relationship they have with their highest deity, Odin. He is both an intensely personal and regional god of the Scandinavians, their divine ancestor in many cases, but is also called the Allfather, the shaper of the whole world. This is a common thing for those so-called pagans and heathens who reject the importance of the tribe and the blood to bring up. Odin is the Allfather, not the Sumfather, they say implying that anyone, regardless of their ancestral background, could merely assimilate to uniquely Indo-European religions and worldviews without an issue. However, Pliny's insight into the mindset of the ancient Scandinavians and their perception of the world gives us a clearer picture of what they really meant. Odin, to them, was the creator and lord of all things, and to them all things were within their own nation, their own tribe. The Scandinavian people have a rather unique identity even amongst Europeans, isolated for centuries. Many parts of Scandinavia were thought of as almost mythical. Even Tacitus tells us that in those lands the sun can be seen and even heard descending into the water. It was a place shrouded in myth and mystery the bitter, biting cold keeping out prying eyes and keeping away the imperial ambitions of mighty empires like that of Rome and even the merchant fleets of Carthage. For thousands of years, the Scandinavians were content to keep their focus inward, unbothered by the murmurings from outside. Though, when the Nordic people had decided that it was the right time to enter the world stage, the whole world took notice. In fact, it seemed as if the moment the Germanic tribes had been pacified after so many years, when the Roman Empire had fallen into a state of cosmopolitan degeneracy, it was the Nordic peoples who descended into the rest of Europe from the high north of Scandinavia, for conquest, for plunder, for fame and for glory. In this era in which the media, in this case Netflix and the TV show Vikings, chooses to portray Jarl Hakon, a hero and a warrior who fought in defence of his Nordic pagan traditions, as a tolerant black woman in a multicultural society, we feel that it is incredibly important to speak out about our true history. Portraying Jarl Hakon, a white man who fought against the Christianization of his people, as a tolerant black woman, goes to a level of absurdity that borders almost on self-parody. 
If I were trying to mock the mainstream media and their portrayal of historical Nordic peoples, this is exactly what I would do as an ironic joke. But this is what they've become brazen enough to depict in their supposedly historically accurate shows. With that established, we'll begin with the Swedish people. The Swedes, first called the Suiones, take their name, as we mentioned last episode, from the Indo-European word Sue, which means one's own kind. This name appears throughout Indo-European tribal names and includes the Swabi Germanics and the Sabine Latins. The very name of Sweden therefore means land of our own kind, which can be seen by some as rather bitterly ironic given the demographics of Sweden in the current day. It would seem that by launching a deliberate attack on the homogeneity of Sweden, they have not just subverted a people and a state, but they seek to subvert and tread underfoot the very meaning of Sweden in the first place. Tacitus mentions them as having some cultural characteristics that set them apart from the other Germanics. First of all, their kings rule with far more authority than amongst the other tribes, whose kings often have less influence than the leaders of tribal warbands. Second, the ancient Swedes did not have the right to bear arms, and all weapons would be kept stored away. It was thought that a combination of idle hands and weapons could quickly turn to revolt, and the Swedes far preferred to settle internal matters peacefully and keep their tribe and society unified. However, it should not at all be said that the Swedes were a pacifistic people. Even in the times of Tacitus, the ancient Swedes were known for their shipbuilding skills, which had made them a very powerful tribe and a force to be reckoned with. Tacitus tells us that they are distinguished not only for their arms and men, but for their powerful fleets. He says that they built long ships with prows on both ends, a design that would be later refined into the infamous Viking longship, which inspired fear and dread on the coasts of many nations for centuries. It seems that even at the first mention of them in the historical record, the Swedes were already associated with the thing that would make them so successful. Later on, their mastery of shipbuilding and their vast fleets would earn them fame, fortune, glory, and a place in the history books as the Viking raiders and the great heathen army blazed a trail through Europe and the world. But the Suiones, though they have given their name to the Swedes of today, are not the only tribe to have contributed to the formation of the Swedes. Therefore, we must also speak about a more famous tribe, the Goths. According to legend, the Goths took their name from their tribal founder, Gautir, also called Goat, thought by some to be a descendant of Odin, and others to be another name of Odin himself. The two names are obviously very similar. The only difference is that Gotir, ending in the name Tyr, denotes a god, whereas Goat appears more of a demigod of sorts, comparable to Helen or Romulus as an ancestor of the Gothic peoples. The interesting thing is that the demigod Goat is sometimes given as a son of Odin other times as a son of Tatwa, who is variably given as a deity or a mortal man, depending on the source. Tatwa, especially given the context of the figure's role in Gothic ancestry, bears no small amount of resemblance to the Indo-European word tutor, meaning tribe. As we have discussed previously, there have also been many gods and demigods who have borne this name as an epithet denoting their role as a divine ancestor. As we have mentioned before, the Romans and those Germanics and Celts who served in the Roman army all venerated Mars Tutatis, Mars of the tribe, the Indo-European ancestral war god. As well as these gods, the Gothic author Jordanes, who is a Christian, also wrote about three significant Gothic kings, the number three once again showing a great importance in the religion and history of the Indo-European peoples. The final and most famous of these three kings was called Zalmoxis. Jordanes follows the standard approach of taking gods of a people who were still nationalistic and proud of their heritage, having only recently converted to Christianity, and purported that the gods of their people were actually just men of history that the people had mistakenly began venerating as a god. However, Zalmoxis was mentioned as also having been worshipped by the Getae, 
a Scythian tribe that many, including the Goths themselves, believed to be closely related to the Goths. He is thought by many to have been a demigod of sorts who died and was resurrected, possessing traits of both a sky deity and a deity of the underworld, and is thought to be attached to certain mysteries and rites. Parallels can be drawn rather easily to Dionysus, for example. Things get really rather interesting, however, when looking at the name of this first king of the Gete, of whom very little information remains. His name was Zyuta, and I believe that this name is also related to Teuta, the Indo-European word denoting someone or something to do with the tribe. The word Deus became Deus, Teus, and Zeus, so for the word Teuta to follow the same pattern and morph into Zyuta over time, I believe, makes perfect sense. The Swedes as a whole also claimed to be descended from the Norse god Freyr, which would imply that there are several lines of divine descent carried within Swedish veins. There was also another deity from which the Goths claimed ancestry, a god by the name of Teus. Teus is, as we have previously discussed with Tyr, etymologically related closest to Deus, the Sky Father, but in terms of his role in the Pantheon, he's more of the war god. Uh, much like other Europeans, the Gothic people claim to be the descendants of the Indo-European god of war, the god being seen as a protector, ancestral progenitor, and of course, the god of war and the art thereof. Of course, all of these things concern the blood, whether that be its spilling or its preservation. It's no surprise, then, that Teus was equated with Mars, even by the predominantly Christian Romans and Goths. Mars, who is also said to possess similar qualities and functions as an ancestral war god, and even the Christian Gothic historian Jordanes, who wrote the Gothic history book known as the Getica, gives the name of the god of the Goths as Mars, though this is obviously because he had been Romanized. The name of the Goths also has an interesting meaning beyond that of the name of a deity. It is thought that the Goths poured libations as offerings before statues of these gods, and that these statues were called Guth. This means that their name, in effect, means those who pour libations, and this shows just how integral their traditions and their gods were to the ancient Goths. It's also interesting that Gotir, Goth, Goth, Godan, Guth, and God all have very similar etymology and are all used in the context of tribal affiliations bound by blood and matters of the divine, almost as if matters of blood and matters of religion are inherently intertwined. In fact, the Goths' own actions would reflect this, but we'll return to this later. The Goths were said to have worshipped a trinity of deities, once again linking back to the Indo-European trinity of gods, this trinity was at the head of their pantheon, but was not the sole focus of their worship. Gothic paganism put a heavy emphasis on ancestor veneration, which was not necessarily unique to them as a pre-Christian Indo-European people. The veneration of one's ancestors has always been a major part of pagan religions, as it was thought that the deceased ancestor would continue to be a part of the family life, guiding and protecting their descendants, so long as they were properly honoured. Oftentimes, a belief in reincarnation would factor in, but there isn't enough evidence or information on the Gothic beliefs regarding the afterlife to be able to make a definitive statement. The three main deities that the Goths worshipped were Goat, Teus, and Fergunis, equated with Odin, Tyr, and Thor. Fergunis is thought to be derived from the name of the Indo-European thunder god, Perquinos. These three gods are known as the Aesir, or Ansic, in Gothic. Modern scholarship insists that the name Aesir derives from the Asians, such as the tribe of Alans, Indo-Europeans who mig migrated out of Iran, and either came to be worshipped as the Norse gods, or over time their land became known as the homeland of the gods. Even the famous Christian poet Snorri Sturluson purported this theory. But, as we have said, it's very common for people who have recently converted to Christianity to make their old gods into mortal men, often kings, 
This happened even to the Romans when the Sibylline oracles, Judeo-Christian texts purporting the Roman gods and goddesses as mortal men and women, replaced the similarly titled Sibylline books, which were sacred ancient Roman texts burned by Christians who felt that their advice was too critical of the Christian establishment. More on this in a future episode. I do not believe that the Aesir have a name derived from Avon. My foremost reason for this is the Etruscans. These were a non-Indo-European tribe of native Europeans who lived in Italy and spoke a language which is still mostly impossible to decipher today due to the campaign of ethnic and cultural extermination waged by the Roman patricians against their non-Indo-European neighbours. The Etruscans were living in Italy long before the Latin tribes had ever arrived. Their artwork, which we will display in the YouTube video, seemingly depicts a banquet with tanned black-haired shirtless Italian men and pale blonde-haired people wearing thicker clothing, almost implying they had come from somewhere colder. The academic explanation for this is that these are Etruscan women, but they are displayed with the same haircuts and facial features as the Etruscan men, giving no indication whatsoever that these are women. So why am I bringing up a non-Indo-European Italic people while talking about the Nordic Goths? Because they had a word for their gods, they called them the Aesir. The Etruscans were also called Tyrrhenians by the Greeks, a name which bears no passing similarity to Tyr, but this may be a simple coincidence. But the fact that they called the gods Aesir and were uh, familiar with a group of pale blonde people is certainly interesting to me. Going back to the Goths, what was their culture and lifestyle like? Well, besides being a warrior aristocracy, the same as any other healthy Indo-European society, they were accomplished farmers. They were also highly skilled potters and blacksmiths, and their artisan jewellery is often breathtaking. And for those taxation is theft anarcho-capitalists who accidentally stumbled across this video, You'll be pleased to know that the Gothic kingdoms did not pose any taxes whatsoever on their subjects, whether citizens or not. In fact, there are tales of Roman citizens fleeing the Roman provinces and going off to live with the Goths, as the rates of taxation had been incredibly high since the ascension of Constantine. To quote the Christian Roman writer Salvian, for in the Gothic country, the barbarians are so far from tolerating this sort of oppression that not even Romans who live among them have to bear it. Hence, all the Romans in that region have but one desire, that they may never have to return to the Roman jurisdiction. It is the unanimous prayer of the Roman people in that district that they may be permitted to continue to lead their present life among the barbarians. So, far from being the savages of popular imagination, it seems that even by the 5th century the Goths were able statesmen, as well as noble warriors and talented artisans and farmers. It's also well documented that the Goths believed in witchcraft and cast out its practitioners from the tribe long before their conversion to Christianity. This healthy contempt of witchcraft was common in pagan societies, much to the dismay of Wiccans who seemed to believe that pre-Christian Europe was some kind of bastion of magic feminism. The Goths believed that these witches who were cast out from society made their way east and coupled with evil and unclean spirits, later giving birth to the Huns. Where did the Goths live? Obviously they're known to have come from Sweden and descended into Europe and their name is all over Sweden. Most obviously in Gotland and the Gota River, which gives its name to Sweden's second largest city, Gothenburg. They later spread out across Europe, settling across Italy, Spain, France and even as far as Ukraine, the Goths having a very sizable population there. These were known as the Crimean Goths, and were a distinctly Gothic people well into the Middle Ages, and they are worthy of a video of their own in the future. There was even a Gothic kingdom in Greece. The latest spread and warfare of the Goths as a whole people is something that I would love to cover in the future, but it isn't really relevant to the origins of the Swedish people, so it will have to be left for another time. Well, what did the Goths look like? They were unanimously described by all who saw them as being tall, 
very good looking, with pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, and strong limbs. Regarding the question of ancestry, when the old pagan beliefs had begun to fade in the minds of the Nordic people, they began to accept the origin stories that their enemies had written of them. It seems that the fear of these men of the north, who have gone under many names over time, dates back for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Some of you may have heard of Gog and Magog, the biblical figures who appear throughout Abrahamic tradition across Christianity, Islam and Judaism. These men are, according to the sources, an unstoppable tide of warriors from the far north, hated and feared by the Hebrews and their god, who will forever threaten the safety of the Abrahamic faiths. In fact, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel that the devil himself, the supreme embodiment of evil in the minds of the Hebrews and the Semitic peoples, will rally the men of the north into a mighty army to fight in a final apocalyptic battle against Yahweh and Rabbi Yeshua ben Yosef, more commonly known as Jesus Christ. In fact, it is said that this great rallying of the north into a mighty army is a harbinger of the Christian, Islamic and Jewish apocalypse, the end of their world. I'm inclined to agree. If the men of the North unite under a single banner, united by blood and tradition, it would inevitably signal the end of those foreign yokes still bore by Scandinavia in the present day. Hypothetically, of course. I do not wish to descend this podcast into merely taking pot shots at Christianity, as defining oneself by what you're not rather than what you are can only ever lead to disaster. But at the same time, when such passages as this exist, expressing such unabashed hatred for the Nordic peoples, equating them with the greatest concept of evil in the mind of the Abrahamic religions, one cannot simply sit idly by. This clear hatred of our people is already written within the pages of a so-called tradition that has been used only to usurp our true traditions, weaken our connection to our ancestors and our gods, and have us buy into worshipping a so-called god that appears to despise the warlike men of the north as a threat to his own power. I have no stomach for remaining quiet on such matters in which my ancestors are subjected to such ancient insults, given credit simply because of the antiquity of their hatred. The first recording equation of these men of the High North and these immoral barbarians of the Abrahamic religions was from the Jewish historian Josephus, and the insult stuck for some time, continuing to be propagated for some time by other Christian historians. Within a few generations, Scandinavians had gone from rightly seeing themselves as descendants of the gods and heroes, mighty warriors and powerful kings, to being the offspring of wretches worthy only of scorn. Our point with this podcast is to remind our people that your perception of yourself and your blood matters. Your worldview is shaped by your sense of self, which is in turn shaped by your tribe, your blood, your people. A perception that man once inherited from his ancestors, but in this age of the struggle, we must strive to prove ourselves and reclaim the birthright of our blood. It is important to remember what history is, especially the history of your own people. History is not merely an area of interest or dry academic study, nor is it merely a source of stories from which we can seek inspiration. This is, of course, part of it. History is not something to just be looked back on, it is something we inherit. It is our burden to shoulder. It is what we have been given by our ancestors and what we give to our children. There is no line that divides the blood of the past from the blood that flows through your veins at this very moment. History did not stop being created 10, 50, 100 years ago, just as the Aryan Skyfather was said to have defeated the Titan Kronos, establishing his rule over time itself, so too has our blood, which ultimately comes from him. It existed then, now and always, so long as we are worthy of taking on that mantle. And so, men of the North, men of all Europe, Is your history, your blood, that of gods and heroes as you once thought, as you once knew, or mindless savages like your enemies claim? Returning to the Goths as a people, it is said that they, along with all the Nordic peoples, did not have a dedicated priest caste, which makes them rather unique amongst the Indo-European peoples, who appear to have had a priest caste since before records began, almost always made up of the aristocracy. 
These include groups like the Druids and the Flamen, but also extend much further. Even their closest relatives, the Germanic tribes, had a caste of priests, so this was indeed an oddity. However, one thing that the Gothic religious institution did have in common with the rest of their Indo-European brethren is the sacred role of the king, who, despite not having a priesthood dedicated solely to religious matters, still performed the function of the high priest, which has always been part of the role of the king. This king and spiritual leader had a name that will sound familiar to anyone who has watched our first episode. Uh, the Goths called them Reeks. This is the same Indo-European word as Rig, Rex, and Rix, used by the Norse, Latins, and Celts respectively, and preserved to this day in the English word Regal, the Italian Re, the German Reich, amongst others, including the official name of Sweden itself, which I will not attempt to pronounce, I will butcher it. We have, in many of our episodes, spoken of how the position of the king in all ancient and healthy societies was a man who encapsulated the values of the two highest castes in Indo-European society, the warriors and the priests, and thus his role was both a military and spiritual position, not just a matter of secular politics. The king was in charge of safeguarding the traditions of his people and maintaining their good relationship with the gods, as well as demonstrating his worth as a military leader. The king was therefore the protector of the people both physically and spiritually. This is, in our opinion and that of our ancestors, the ideal king, the reeks, the leader. These gothic reeks would, as mentioned, perform a set religious duties and oversee religious rites. One of these duties was to perform the communal sacrifice to the gods, which was a great honour and responsibility that not only gained the favour of the gods, but also brought the community together. This was the case for all Indo-European societies, and the coming together of the tribe for these events was integral to their bond as a people, allowing them to feel connected to their kinsmen and the gods. So, when a certain group appeared to shun and disrespect the gods, it was not only seen as a way of drawing the ire of their gods and ancestors, but also spitting in the face of the tribe as a whole. This made groups like Christians outcasts in society for a number of reasons, and their refusal to seek compromise instead of martyrdom only made things worse. These growing religious tensions, brought to the Goths by enslaved foreigners, much as it had in Rome, began to upset Gothic society and those who were determined to hold steadfast to the religious traditions of their ancestors. This meant that it fell to the Reeks to punish them, and ensure that their traditions were adhered to and given their due reverence. While the persecutions of Jews and Christians by the Romans are well known and well documented, what is not talked about is the Gothic persecutions. While not as widespread, the Gothic leaders enacted very similar policies to the ones used by the Romans, without any apparent knowledge of how they were carried out. This style of persecution against these violations of ethnic traditions appearing to come naturally to Indo-Europeans. Again, I wish to emphasise that my point here isn't to devolve into overdone anti-Christian drivel, but rather to represent the opposition the noble heroes of our people presented to those who fought against our ancestral traditions. Many regard the Germanic resistance to Roman rule as a defence of Germanic traditions against those of Rome, but this is absolutely not the case. Not only did the Romans allow those they conquered, especially those of an Indo-European origin whose religious traditions were more easily assimilated with their own, to continue with their own traditions as they saw fit, but the conquered Germanic and Celtic peoples even began to voluntarily equate their gods with those of Rome. Due to their fellow Indo-European origins, this was easy, and required no compromise of religious tradition on either part. The Celts and Germanics, as we have established many times before, called their own ancestral war god Mars Teutatus, Mars of the tribe, and this is merely one example. Under this name, the old Celtic and German rites of worship of Teutatus continued, though only passively influenced by the Roman worship of Mars, adopting those things which they deemed appropriate as offerings to the gods, something which the Romans likewise adopted from the Celts and Germanics that they fought alongside. In fact, the Romans suppressed very few religions. Their persecution of the Druids is well known, but this was purely political. 
the Druids represented a threat to Roman authority, and it was the Druids as a caste that were persecuted, not Celtic paganism, which continued to thrive even under Roman rule. They also executed the Maenads, a cult of women who worshipped Bacchus Dionysus by becoming publicly intoxicated with alcohol and drugs. However, this was again not a matter of religion as such, but more public morality. It was illegal for women to drink wine in their own homes, let alone in public, and so action was taken on this basis. Worship of Bacchus Dionysus was not illegal, but this method of practice was. The only religions that were persecuted on a purely religious basis were Christianity and Judaism, but this discussion is for another episode. My point here is not to aggrandise Rome, though of course my own personal admiration and bias has obviously been laid bare, but rather I wish to demonstrate that even though the Romans were seen as an obvious threat to Germanic sovereignty in terms of their nation, they were not in any way a threat to their religious traditions. After all, if you were a Norse pagan, as many of the members of our audience no doubt are, and you conquered a foreign nation, would you want them to adopt your traditions? Of course not. This would be seen as detrimental for a number of reasons. First of all, your rights as a people, as a tribe, as a race, were to gain the favour of the gods. Would you want to risk another people gaining their favour instead of you? Secondly, or would you not see this as a form of theft? It's no coincidence that those who attach themselves least to universal religions contend the idea of cultural appropriation the most. Finally, the adoption of your own culture and religion by foreigners would more easily allow them to assimilate with your own people, a lesson learned the hard way by the Romans in the later era of their dying empire and by our modern civilization. The Romans were the culture we have the best records of in terms of their attitude towards the Abrahamic faiths and how and why they dealt with them. This gives us a good insight into the attitude of Indo-Europeans towards these alien ideologies, an insight that we are unfortunately missing from other European cultures. Overall, my point is to reinforce that while the Indo-Europeans have faced many threats to their national independence, they have faced no true threat to their religion, their tradition, and their connection to the gods until their contact with Christianity. And just as the Christian Europeans would fiercely defend their Christian traditions against those of the Islamic invaders, the pagan defiance of Christianity is the first recorded example of this uniquely spiritual struggle and therefore no earlier examples can be given. And so, the conflict between the Goths and the Christians must be spoken of, in order to bring to light lesser known examples of the ways in which the Goths fought in defence of their ancestral traditions. And so, returning to the reeks of the Gothic people, whose role it was to enforce the adherence to their people's ancestral traditions, it was at this point in history when the rejection of said traditions was becoming popular, that your ability was called into service. Enter one of the most famous Gothic Greeks of all, Athanaric. His name, as was common with many European rulers from across the centuries, even contains the title Rick, such as many uh, Celtic rulers had names ending in Rix, like the famous Vercingetorix, or even the god Mars Albiorix and so it would seem as if Athenaric had big shoes to fill. The Goths first came into contact with Christianity in much the same way the Romans did, through their slaves. When the Roman Emperor Decius had decreed that all people living within the boundaries of the Empire would have to sacrifice to the ancestral gods or be executed, many Christians fled from the Empire and found themselves ambushed by the Goths, who slaughtered the migrating men and took the women as slaves. As they won victory after victory in battle, predominantly in heavily Christian areas, they took more captives as slaves, and slowly the makeup of their society was fundamentally altered, drawing a rather stark parallel to the Romans once again. When the threat to Gothic traditions was apparent, the aristocracy, led by the Reeks, did exactly what Decius and Diocletian had done in Rome. He gathered up villages of people and demanded that they sacrifice to the gods. Predictably, those who refused to adhere to their ancestral traditions were not looked kindly upon. The Gothic pagans had actually attempted to hide the Christians within their ranks in order to save their kinsmen, but the Christian Goths rejected this display of unity. 
Many rejected their Gothic culture altogether, and even though they were Goths, they would take new, often Syrian, names in order to mark themselves out as new men and Christians, seemingly in opposition to their Gothic kinsmen and culture. They would rather die for Christ than live for their people. Is there any greater display of contempt for one's own people than to reject not only the name they gave you, but to then take on names of foreigners from another continent? This is, to give a modern equivalent, like a Swedish man rejecting his friends and family, and changing his name to Shaka Zulu or Muhammad, and trying to convince everyone around him to do the same. When his friends and family confront him on his odd behaviour, he tells them that they are persecuting him and they will all burn in hell for eternity when his friend comes back. When put into perspective, it becomes easy to see why Christianity and Judaism was so uniquely hated by traditionalist societies in Europe. But, rather than merely keeping quiet about their beliefs, as their fellow villagers had suggested, many instead actively pursued death, wishing to make themselves martyrs, a fate they quickly found, despite the tendency of the Gothic leadership to deem them not worth worrying about. When the Gothic Christians began to move to Christian Rome in order to seek shelter as refugees, they were mocked and derided as looking like clowns, according to those Romans who still held true to their ancestral faith, and accused of being pagans who had disguised themselves as Christians by Roman Christians who wanted to save face. Anti-Christian attitudes amongst the Goths continued for a very long time, and there were even armies of Goths who had gone to war against Rome, proclaiming that they would make the Christian Roman politicians into sacrifices to the gods. Clearly, they had a rather extreme hatred towards anyone who sought to tear them away from their ancestral traditions. The most fascinating part of the Gothic persecution, however, was the fact that any non-Gothic Christians were outright ignored by the Goths and allowed to continue as they saw fit. The Goths had no care for the men outside their kin abandoning their own traditions. It was only the preservation of Gothic traditions for Goths that concerned them. This, of course, was ultimately a mistake, allowing foreign influence to continue to erode their traditions, values and ways of life, but it was a typical trait of Indo-European peoples to not concern themselves with the interests and traditions of foreign peoples. Each tribe and people were free to continue practicing their religion in the ways of their ancestors, as religion was seen as an affair that concerned only the tribe. This is an aspect that is unfortunately glossed over by an otherwise terrific YouTuber that I'm sure most of our audience is already familiar with, Asher Logos. While much of his work is obviously stellar, his coverage of the Goths deliberately misinforms the listener into believing that the Goths willingly converted to Christianity, but chose to adopt the Arian doctrine rather than what was popular in Rome at the time. Arian, for the record, is named after the Roman Christian Arius, not the word Arian. This is utterly incorrect. Not only did a large majority of the Goths attempt to exterminate all Christians in their midst and invade Rome to destroy Christianity once and for all, but the Roman Emperor at the time, Valens, was himself an Arian. So if they had converted to Arianism in order to resist the will of the Arian Roman Empire, they could have only been complete fools, but we will discuss their reason for conversion later. As well as this, Arianism, much like positive Christianity, which would come far later, rejected the idea of Rabbi Yeshua ben Yosef being in any way divine, something which goes against the core tenets of all Christianity in the modern day. On top of this, the Gothic Bible, as we have mentioned in previous episodes, borrowed the term God to refer to Yahweh, a title that had previously been used to refer to Odin. So, to these Aryan Christians, who would later be branded heretics and massacred, they were still worshipping the same god they had already been worshipping, just in a different way, and they rejected the supposed divinity of Jesus. To put this into perspective, if I told you that my buddy gave me money to convert from a Roman pagan to a Christian, and I said, sure, I'm a Christian now, but I'm not really into the whole Jesus thing, and I'm going to call God Jupiter. You wouldn't exactly call me a Christian, would you? One can't help but feel as if 
Asher Logos' own Christianity brings about heavy bias on the subject, as no doubt our traditionalist sentiments bias our own coverage. But we do not see the history of Europeans as a mere story of their conversion to Christianity. Our history is not to be equated with our dealings with foreign affairs for the few short centuries it has been around. It's a shame that he feels the need to gloss over our history in order to make his foreign religion seem more palatable to Europeans who are casting off the foreign yoke and returning to their roots. Such events as past persecutions and religious wars are not things to be taken lightly. While we don't want to dwell on this for too long, at the risk of seeming petty, I would like to say that by removing the traditionalist struggle of the European pagan Goths against Christianity almost entirely, and framing it as some kind of purely secular political fight, you have done the enemy's job for them. Their goal has always been to sever us from our history and our tradition, and by severing history from tradition, even in the minds of those Europeans who have woken up to their tricks, you have made their job all the easier. Do not sacrifice truth, history and the beliefs of our greatest ancestors on the altar of a foreign faith that seeks only our enslavement and destruction. When the Christian Romans heard of the Goths persecuting their fellow Christians, they were quick to intervene, leading to the Gothic Wars of 376 to 382 CE. While I'm sure many of our listeners will be familiar with the concept of the Gothic Wars, and perhaps may have even heard of these wars while knowing almost nothing of the Goths themselves, very few would be able to guess at their cause, and fewer still would guess that many Goths chose to turn traitor and fight against their own kinsmen. The image of the Goths we have in the modern day is of marauding barbarians descending on innocent civilians, pillaging and slaughtering wherever they went, and forcing Western Rome to fight back against this unstoppable tide of bloodthirsty savages. But in actual fact, this was not the case. Of course, the Romans have been fighting back Gothic incursions into their territories for decades at this point, but nothing had been on the scale of these long years of war. In fact, as we will no doubt talk about in a future episode, the Roman Empire had begun to over-rely on Germanic and Gothic soldiers to fight its wars during its decline into decadence, and during the Christian period this would reach its pinnacle. The Goths at this time were split into two factions, one side following Fittigern, a man whose name means desiring peace in Gothic, an irony that will shortly be pointed out. The rest of the Goths were following Athanaric, the persecutor of Christians mentioned earlier. The two had been rivals as reeks of their tribes, and a civil war broke out between the Goths, a war that Fittigern began to quickly lose. While Athanaric was persecuting Christians, it should not be said that all of the Goths serving under Fittigern were themselves Christians rebelling against this, not by any means. After all, Christians at this point made up a sizeable minority, but nowhere near enough to field an army to rival the rest of the Goths. So, rather than uniquely religious strife, there were also some inter-tribal loyalties and politics involved. The matters of religious conflict were, for the most part, a lesser concern for the ordinary men and women who were not part of the pagan Gothic nobility or the Christian slaves and converts. When it was clear that Fittigern was going to lose the Gothic Civil War, he then turned to the Romans to intervene and help him defeat the other Goths. In return, he and all of his Gothic subjects pledged themselves as servants of the Romans who would fight on their behalf. As new servants of Romans, Fittigern would convert to Arian Christianity, the same denomination as the Roman Emperor Valens, who was in charge at the time. Here we see the first of many cases in which a ruler who desired power, be it through military means or trade, would convert to Christianity for political reasons. Where once the Romans of old would have demanded displays of loyalty for their alliance, these new Romans would instead demand a conversion to Christianity instead. And so, selling out his people's traditions and freedoms for his own political power, Fittigern made his people servants of the Romans and encouraged them to convert to Christianity, an act that he would very quickly come to regret. <laughs>
The Christian Romans and Fittigern's Goths then defeated Athanaric, who was by this point completely outnumbered. He was forced to retreat into the east, where he would then have to confront one of the most dire threats Western Europe would ever face. The unstoppable tide of the Huns. But this is a story for another episode. And so it was agreed that Fittigern's Goths would be allowed to settle in Roman land and serve in the Roman army as soldiers, which had become an increasingly common practice by this point. The Romans themselves were no longer bothered about fighting in the legions as proud descendants of Mars himself, so the newly Christianised Romans were more than happy to pay the Germanic and Gothic peoples to do their fighting for them. As the Roman soldier and historian Ammianus Marcellinus, himself still a pagan, described it, diligent care was taken so that no future destroyer of the Roman state should be left behind. During this period of migration, the Romans had promised the Goths food until they were allocated proper lands with which they could supply themselves. However, they had not accounted for the logistic issue of having so many people in the same place and were unable to supply the food they had promised. Instead, they told the Goths that they would sell them rotten dog meat to eat. The price? One rotten dog's worth of meat for every Gothic child sold into slavery. The Goths obviously did not take kindly to this, and were instead moved closer to a Roman garrison where they could be watched more closely. On the way, the Goths passed villages and towns who offered to sell them supplies, seemingly at prices the Goths were more than willing to pay. However, the soldiers watching them refused to allow them to purchase any food or supplies from them on the journey. Attempting to negotiate with the Romans for better treatment of their people, Fitigern and his second-in-command, Alavivus, requested a meeting with the senior Roman officer in charge of overseeing this Gothic migration. The Roman officer agreed, and they met to negotiate. However, for reasons that can only be assumed, the officer seemed to want the Goths leaderless and rendered completely servile, and so had Alavivus slain during the meeting with Fittigern only narrowly escaping the same fate. At this point, the Goths, who were still armed to the teeth, could have rebelled against the soldiers exploiting them, but instead continued to follow orders. The Goths slowed their march to a crawl, crippled by injury, starvation and disease. These Christian politicians and magistrates in charge of overseeing the whole affair had deprived the Goths of their property and now tried to exploit them even further by taking from them their wives and daughters. Bearing in mind, the pagan Romans became the enemies of the Germanic tribesmen for wanting to impose a tax on them, while genuinely wanting to incorporate the Germanic peoples into their empire, believing that this was what was best for them. And even this breach of their freedoms had provoked the Germanics into total rebellion. So why had the Goths, enduring far worse humiliations, not erupted into rebellion at such an outrage? The Romans escorting them became increasingly frustrated with the apparent weakness of these Goths, seeing them drag their feet and march at a snail's pace to their intended destination. But only when it was far, far too late did they realise what was truly going on. Far from being the mindless barbarians popular in fiction, the Goths had simply been springing their trap. What the foolish so-called Romans had taken for weakness was simply the Goths buying time. Reinforcements had arrived, and they were out for blood. But still, they appeared to offer some mercy, and marched away from these Romans and towards Scythia, away from the Roman ranks. The Romans pursued them, however, and so began the Battle of Marcianople. Here the Goths won a decisive victory, salvaging weapons and armour from the defeated Romans, and so it was not long before the Goths across the Empire began to join their kinsmen in revolt. What had begun as a simple migration, with Goths eager to serve as soldiers, had instead become a full-scale uprising. And it's worthy of clarification here, this was not an ambush. When you read accounts of the Germanic victory at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, 
You'll notice that the Roman legionaries were caught completely off guard and led straight into a massacre by their somewhat incompetent commanding officer, who had put too much faith in his underling Arminius, who used clever tactics and surprise to cripple the Roman ranks. But here there was no such finesse, no ambushes. Both sides lined themselves up against one another and did battle the old-fashioned way. Scores of competent, experienced officers and the Emperor himself leading the charge, with over double the men. Had this been the glory days of the Roman legions, the days of Camillus and Scipio, or Augustus and Vespasian marching under the eagle of the Sky Father, then this would have almost certainly meant certain death for the outnumbered Goths facing a professional army. But, before we begin to talk of the battle, how did Gothic armies fight? We often hear of how the Romans were overwhelmed by the Gothic armies, but that isn't the whole truth. After all, how can an army be overwhelmed by a band of men half their number? Well, as in the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, the Germanic tribes won a crushing victory by isolating pockets of the Roman army and eradicating them piece by piece, but this was not the way of the Goths. These Goths would not ambush their Roman enemies, they would draw swords and face them in the field. The bulk of the Gothic troops were heavy infantry, and were not professional soldiers, but farmers who would take up arms either as levies or volunteers. This is, strangely enough, exactly how the Romans had started out around a thousand years ago, as soldier farmers, and the Goths would later conquer Rome and reinvigorate it, rebirthing its original martial spirit. Perhaps, then, there is something to be said for the European soldier-farmer lifestyle, and it is no coincidence that Mars, the god of war, protector of farmers and farmland, and the god of the tribe, was venerated by both the Romans and the Goths, though the Goths obviously worshipped him under a different name. And, as we go forward, it should become obvious who the god of war favoured by this time. Returning to the composition of the Gothic army, their heavy infantry troops were armed with a range of swords, such as the Spatha, a Roman sword that had previously only been used by cavalry forces, due to being longer than the standard Roman gladius, but preferred by Gothic swordsmen for this very reason. They could also be carrying axes, a type of knife or dagger, as well as throwing axes and pikes, and of course, wooden shields. The Gothic nobility would often be sporting chainmail armour, and iron, sometimes steel, helmets, and some would be wearing a type of armour known as lamella, which is made of lots of small plates joined together over the top of their chainmail. However, this was generally only amongst the nobility. The vast majority of the Goths were, as we have just mentioned, regular farmers. Many could not afford such extravagant protection. And so, most would go into battle with spears, axes, and no body armour at all. Just imagine the bravery of these men, leaving behind their farms on a whim, possibly unable to afford even the most basic of protection, and still facing down scores of trained professional soldiers, all with good quality armour and weapons, and then returning to your farm when it's all done. This was the method of fighting for the early soldiers of antiquity, and here we are nearing the 4th century and the Goths are still using this system to go up against professional standing armies whose numbers dwarfed their own, and still striking fear and dread into them regardless. Such was the might of the Gothic warrior. Even in death, the Goths were said to be utterly terrifying to the Romans, with Marcellinus writing, you might see the barbarian towering in his fierceness, hissing or shouting, fall with his legs pierced through, or his right hand cut off, sword and all, or his side transfixed, and still, in the last gasp of life, casting around him a defiant gaze. However, they were not solely heavy infantrymen. They also had mounted horse archers, who could fire arrows while on horseback before retreating out of range of the enemy, but the real jewel of the Gothic forces were their heavy cavalry. These were the armoured tanks of the ancient world, and we'll hear more about them shortly. So, back to the battle. 
The Goths had fought a handful of indecisive battles against the Romans before this, and many who had not been able to afford proper weapons and armour could now arm themselves with equipment scavenged from the defeated Romans. Two Roman generals had found recent success, one in ambushing some small groups of Goths and forcing the main Gothic force to withdraw, and the other in beating back a Germanic tribe called the Alemanni. And, rather than celebrating this, the Emperor Valens had become jealous of their victories, desperately wanting some glory for himself. One could also assume that it didn't help the Emperor's jealous disposition that the generals who had won these victories were not Aryan Christians like himself. Marcellinus describes both the Emperor Valens positive and negative attributes, though it is in his unswerving criticisms of him that we see exactly what kind of men were in charge of the Empire during this time. He is described thusly. He was an immoderate coveter of great wealth, impatient of labour. He affected an extreme severity and was too much inclined to cruelty. His behaviour was rude and rough, and he was little imbued with skill, either in war or in the liberal arts. He willingly sought profit and advantage in the miseries of others, and was more than ever intolerable in straining ordinary offences into sedition or treason. He cruelly encompassed the death or ruin of many nobles. This also was unendurable, that while he wished to have it appear that all actions and suits were decided according to the law, and while the investigation of such affairs was delegated to judges especially selected as the most proper to decide them, he still would not allow any decision to be given which was contrary to his own pleasure. He was also insulting, passionate, and always willing to listen to all informers, without the least distinction as to whether the charges they were advanced were true or false and this vice is one very much to be dreaded, even in private affairs of everyday occurrence. He was dilatory and sluggish, of a swarthy complexion, had a cast in one eye, a blemish, however, which was not visible at a distance. His limbs were well set, his figure was neither tall nor short, he was knock-kneed, and rather pot-bellied. And so it was to this emperor that the Goths sent out an envoy requesting peace, and offered very generous terms, asking only for the land they had been promised in the first place, in exchange for their service as soldiers, as per their original deal. However, the Emperor Valens rejected this, seeing as he outnumbered the Goths more than two to one, and he really wanted a victory that would bring him glory. He sent the envoys away, declaring them to have been too low a rank to broker peace with the Emperor. However, this was most likely a simple excuse as to decline peace, but avoid looking too bloodthirsty. He was a good Christian, after all. They did, however, agree to exchange hostages at the start of the battle, each sending their own nobles to the other side so as to guarantee both sides time to feed their troops as the Romans were still dehydrated and the Goths had sent their cavalry to forage for food. However, one of the Roman parties accompanying their hostage attacked the Goths without orders. And now the battle lines were drawn. The Goths were setting fires left and right, not to burn the Romans, but to create huge billows of smoke that were pushed downwind into the Roman ranks, who were already exhausted and dehydrated from the long march. The Gothic infantry were defending their wagons, where their supplies and families would sit to watch the battle, as per the Nordic, Celtic and Germanic custom. This was, of course, extremely dangerous. The loss of a battle meant the extermination of an entire tribe, its women being either killed or taken by the enemy. But this was to allow the women of the tribe to share in the danger of their husbands, and to spur the men on to fight to protect their women and the future of their tribe. The Roman objective, then, was to push through to the wagons, and either slaughter the Gothic families watching the battle, or use them to force a retreat or surrender from the Goths. The Goths would try to stop the Romans from achieving this, and delay them until their cavalry returned from foraging. The party who had first attacked the Goths without orders now began to retreat without orders, as Marcellinus describes, 
and as they were on their way towards the enemy's camp, the accompanying archers and Scutari shieldmen, who on that occasion were under the command of Bacarius, a native of Iberia and of Cassio, yielded, while on their march, to an indiscreet impetuosity, and on approaching the enemy, first attacked them rashly, and then, by a cowardly flight, disgraced the beginning of the campaign. The Roman and Gothic lines clashed, both sides fighting bitterly, but the Roman left, accompanied by their cavalry, managed to punch a hole through the formation of the outnumbered Goths and broke through into their wagons, ready to set upon the now defenceless Gothic families. However, it was now that the Gothic cavalry returned, crashing into the Roman ranks, forcing the Roman horsemen to turn and flee in panic. Marcellinus writes, The cavalry of the Goths had returned, and with them a battalion of Alans. These descending from the mountains like a thunderbolt spread confusion and slaughter among all whom in their rapid charge they came across. This being their second failed assault, and now being surrounded by the Gothic heavy cavalry, the Romans broke and fled, abandoning their lines and their advantageous uphill position. Soon they were engulfed in smoke, torn to shreds by missiles they could not see, and hunted down like fleeing prey by the unstoppable Gothic cavalry. And while arms and missiles of all kinds were meeting in fierce conflict, and Bellona, blowing her mournful trumpet, was raging more fiercely than usual to inflict disaster on the Romans, our men began to retreat. But presently, roused by the reproaches of their officers, they made a fresh stand, and the battle increased like a conflagration, terrifying our soldiers numbers of whom were pierced by strokes from the javelins hurled at them, and from arrows. Then the two lines of battle dashed against each other, like the beaks of ships, and thrusting with all their might were tossed to and fro like the waves of the sea. Presently our infantry was left unsupported, while the different companies became so huddled together that a soldier could hardly draw his sword, or withdraw his hand after he had stretched it out. And by this time such clouds of dust arose that it was scarcely possible to see the sky, which resounded with horrible cries, and in consequence the darts, which were bearing death on every side, reached their mark and fell with deadly effect, because no one could see them beforehand so as to guard against them. Amidst all this great tumult and confusion, our infantry were exhausted by toil and danger, until at last they had neither strength left to fight, nor spirits to plan anything. Their spears were broken by the frequent collisions, so that they were forced to content themselves with their drawn swords, which they thrust into the dense battalions of the enemy, disregarding their own safety and seeing that every possibility of escape was cut off from them. The ground, covered with streams of blood, made their feet slip, so that all they endeavoured to do was to sell their lives as dearly as possible, and with such vehemence did they resist their enemies who pressed on them that some were even killed by their own weapons. At last one black pool of blood disfigured everything, and wherever the eye turned it could see nothing but piled up heaps of dead, and lifeless corpses trampled on without mercy. The sun being now high in the heavens, having traversed the sign of Leo and reached the abode of the heavenly Virgo, scorched the Romans, who were emaciated by hunger, worn out with toil and scarcely able to support even the weight of their armour. At last our columns were entirely beaten back by the overpowering weight of the barbarians, and so they took to disorderly flight, which is the only resource in extremity, each man trying to save himself as well as he could. While they were all flying and scattering themselves over roads with which they were unacquainted, the Emperor, bewildered with terrible fear, made his way over heaps of dead, and fled to the battalions of the Lancemen and the Macemen. The precise fate of the Emperor Valens remains unknown, as his body was never found. 
but what is known is that he did not survive the battle that he had so desperately wanted. So, in the end, not only did the Goths refuse to retreat, not only did they hold their own without buckling under such fearful odds, but they crushed the Christian Romans and the traitors who fought with them, inflicting up to 20,000 casualties to those who wished to sever them from their gods and their traditions. Among these dead were 35 senior officers, two generals, and the emperor himself, abandoned by his guard who left the poor wretch to his fate against the unstoppable tide of the Gothic advance, driven by blood and fury, aided by the might of the gods. Marcellinus then sums up the battle. And so the barbarians, their eyes blazing with frenzy, were pursuing our men, in whose veins the blood was chilled with numb horror. Some fell without knowing who struck them down, others were buried beneath the mere weight of their assailants, some were slain by the sword of a comrade, for although they often rallied, there was no ground given, nor did any one spare those who retreated. Besides all this, the roads were blocked by many who lay mortally wounded, lamenting the torment of their wounds, and with them also mounds of fallen horses filled the plains with corpses. To these ever irreparable losses, so costly to the Roman state, a night without the bright light of the moon put an end. The Goths, after their glorious victory, which may well have crippled the empire for good, then began to make their way to the city itself, so that they might plunder its opulent riches. However, they were met with heavy fire from rocks, javelins and other missiles from the city's Arab garrison within the walls. According to legend, one Arab ran out of the gates, slit the throat of a Gothic warrior and then sucked the blood out of his wound. The Goths, seeing this display of outright savagery, decided it wasn't worth putting their men in such danger and getting them killed in a prolonged siege against men who appeared to be cannibals, so they left to plunder easier targets, rather than throw away their huge victory. This part of the story probably isn't true. History and common sense teaches us that one man running at an army goes about as well as you'd expect but the city's Arab garrison fighting against the Goths in defence of Christendom is completely true. So, when Arabs are defending the glory of Christendom against your ancestors, it might be time to reconsider Christianity's relevance to you as a European, and leave Middle Eastern religions to the Middle East. And so, that about wraps it up for this episode. Personally, I would absolutely love to cover the history of the Goths in general in a future episode, and how they went on to conquer and revitalise Rome in their own image, but we have to continue with our series on origin myths for now. The Goths are a fascinating people with an incredible legacy, and the mainstream perception of these great people does not at all do them justice. So, if you want to hear more about them, please let us know down in the comments. We're going to be covering all of Scandinavia in the coming episodes, and all of the major European tribes after that. As mentioned earlier, our upload schedule is going to be a little bit all over the place for a while. Uh, we have some videos that were released on Spreaker, but we're now banned from there, so we're getting them re-uploaded here, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, we're also on Peertube, and make sure to subscribe to our Telegram channel, link in the description. Uh, leave a like and a comment, it does actually really help us out, as videos like ours tend to get buried uh, by the YouTube algorithm. So. This has been Aristogenesis, thank you for listening. Until next time.